Well, I invite you to have your Bible open at that passage on the rich man and Lazarus. <clears throat> now, it's uh, just over 20 years ago, uh, but the summer of 1999 saw some uh, big, important and grand weddings. Personally, the most important, not the grandest, but the most important was my own uh, wedding uh, with Rebecca and some of you were present. Um, shortly after that, the Queen's youngest son, Edward, was married and there was a, a genuine royal wedding. But then came perhaps the most extravagant, the most lavish wedding of the summer. And it was the celebrity wedding of David and Victoria Beckham. At the time, a world famous footballer marrying a pop star. Today, they're really just defined as fabulously rich uh, celebrities. Some of you girls, maybe you, maybe you dream about your, your wedding. Well, at this wedding, uh, Victoria wore a tiara that was worth £30,000. A £30,000 tiara. It was the stuff of royalty. Perhaps the most ostentatious and self-important thing they did on that day was to have two red and gold thrones that they sat on during the ceremony and for their photos. See, they had the wealth and the fame of royalty without the actual titles. And here in this parable that Jesus tells, the rich man is a bit like that. He is defined by his wealth. Jesus only describes him by his wealth, his lavish lifestyle. And he is so wealthy that he dresses and behaves like he is royalty. Jesus tells us he was a rich man clothed in purple and fine linen. Purple was the colour of royalty. See, the dye used to colour the cloth purple. It was taken from your shellfish. It was so rare that purple cloth was very expensive. It was very exclusive to wear purple. So it was the mark of the rich and powerful. So Jesus is telling us something of how exceedingly wealthy this man is. He has the riches of a king. And the description goes on. We read that this man feasted sumptuously. It was every day. Perhaps once in a while, once a week, you might treat yourself to a takeaway or to eat out. This man, he had a banquet every single day. He had the finest food on his plate every day. And he always had more than enough. He lives in luxury. And to go along with that, he lives in a great big gated property. Verse 20 speaks of his gate. This morning when you came into church, you might have come through the front gate. It's a small, simple, unobtrusive gate. Well, the Greek word that Luke uses in the original is what the same word that is described to, to describe the entrance to a temple. This gate is a great, impressive, elaborate gateway, the sort of gate that you'd see on a palace or in a great country house. That's just the entrance. Can you imagine in this man's house? So here is this wealthy man. Jesus only describes him by his wealth, by his extravagant lifestyle. He's only described by those outward appearances, by the very thing that the Pharisees loved and exalted. But God knows your hearts. That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. It's what he says to us. God looks on the inside. We're not told, are we, what this man's heart was like? What was his character like? What sort of person was he? Was he kind? Was he honest? Was he generous? Does his wealth come from being a hard-working, clever businessman? We don't know. But the parable suggests to us that this rich man is anything but kind. He's anything but generous. He's not compassionate, is he? He does nothing for the beggar at his gate. God had given him the means to help Lazarus. But he doesn't care, does he? He's entirely heartless. He's totally selfish. He only ever thinks of himself. He only ever thinks of his own pleasure. He left Lazarus to rot 
outside his own gate. So Jesus describes to us the rich man in verse 19. I wonder how would Jesus describe you this morning? How would Jesus describe you this morning? Are you religious? You're here in church this morning. Does that make you religious? The Pharisees were religious. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, how Christ-like are you? Could Jesus say, here is a man, here is a woman who is clothed in humility, clothed in meekness, in compassion, in kindness, clothed in patience, being forgiving and holy, full of joy and hope? How would Jesus describe you this morning? There was a man called Job. God describes him. He said to Satan, look at this, look at my servant Job. There is none like him on the earth, a blameless, an upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Or would Jesus have to describe you this morning like this rich man? Living for yourself living for the things of this world, living for the pleasures of this life, someone with no heart for God. How would Jesus describe you? Can that description be changed? We need to keep listening to this, the lessons of this parable. The second man in the story is this poor man, a beggar. Jesus names this man in the parable. He names him Lazarus. The contrast between this poor man and the rich man, it couldn't be greater, could it? These two men are poles apart. Their social status, they couldn't be further apart. This rich man, he's at the top of the ladder. Lazarus, he's at the bottom. He couldn't get much lower, could he? He's in the gutter. He's the lowest of the low. This huge gulf exists between them. There will also be a huge gulf that exists between them in eternity. That's a very different sort of gulf. Here is Lazarus, this poor man, this beggar. Jesus tells us that he was laid. The Greek literally is he was dumped. He was dumped at the rich man's gate. He had to be carried there and put there. So he's not only poor, he's also crippled. He's not able to walk, he's crippled. He's impoverished, he's diseased, he's covered in these sores. He has these open, bleeding, weeping sores. That tells us that there isn't anyone who cares enough about Lazarus to come and even tend to him, to clean his sores, to bandage them. He's alone, he's crippled, he's diseased, and then he's hungry. He's always hungry. Jesus tells us he desired, he longed to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. He longed for the scraps, for the leftovers. This is the stuff of beggars raking through the bins. He desired to be fed and the story suggests to us that that desire was never fulfilled. He remained a hungry, starving beggar. Then there's the dogs. The dogs that came and licked his sores. I don't know, do you like dogs? I know some of you may like dogs. Some of you may have had or have a pet dog. These aren't pet dogs in our story. These are wild dogs. These are scavenger dogs. I know some of you don't like dogs. I know some of you, perhaps some of you younger children, are you afraid of dogs? Yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I'm not fussed on dogs. Dogs that come and lick you. Dogs that are in your face. Oh, It's disgusting, isn't it? You want them to go away. And I'm sure that's how Lazarus would have felt. And these dogs, they carry disease. And they would make Lazarus unclean. He's unclean in the eyes of the Pharisees and in the eyes of the Jews. That's how Lazarus would be viewed. He's crippled. He's a beggar. He's despised. He is unclean. He is a social outcast. Why, he must be cursed by God. Look at him, look at him. God must hate Lazarus. There's no place for Lazarus in God's kingdom. That's what the Pharisees thought. But the rich man, 
But look at him. He belongs with God, surely. He's blessed by God. Surely God has blessed him. He has friends. When you have money and wealth, you usually have lots of friends. He enjoys the favour of men. He's a child of Abraham. Later in the parable, he calls Abraham father. He's a child of Abraham. Blessed by God, belongs to God. Surely he has a place booked in heaven. He's just like one of us. So the Pharisees think. Here's the rich man and Lazarus and they are poles apart. They're at different ends of the social spectrum. They have nothing in common. They have nothing in common except one thing. They both die. They both died. Verse 22. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried Rich or poor, great or small death comes to us all. We've had, haven't we, for the past 12 months, daily deaths reported in the media. But it's not just from COVID. There's been some terrible, shocking deaths, hasn't there? Shootings, murders, disasters. There was just over 40 people just these past days crushed to death at a religious event. Daily deaths, some expected, some unexpected. It's not a shock, is it, that Lazarus dies? Here is this starving, diseased man. It's not a shock that Lazarus dies. I'm sure Lazarus would be conscious that death, or a man like Lazarus would be conscious that death was always at his door. But for the rich man, what about the rich man? Was it unexpected? Perhaps he'd given death no thought. Perhaps that he thought he had years ahead of him living in luxury, living for his pleasures, spending his money. Isn't life great? And then suddenly that life is over. That life is snatched away. All the money in the world couldn't prevent his death. When I was a boy or a younger teenager, there was a, a TV series here in the UK. It was called Tales of the Unexpected. These were short stories. They were uh, written by Roald Dahl. Roald Dahl wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Well, these tales were much darker than a, a, a children's story. These were mystery stories. They were often a bit sinister. But they always had a twist at the end. There was always a twist in the tale. And this story that Jesus tells has a twist in the tale and for the Pharisees this is a tale of the unexpected. Here is Lazarus, this poor man, the one they despised, the one that they think is cursed by God and he's carried by God's angels to Abraham's side. Very simply, Lazarus, when he died, went to heaven. But the rich man, the man the Pharisees esteemed, the one they considered blessed by God, the man most like them, he finds himself in hell. He finds himself in Hades. It's a tale of the unexpected. And for the Pharisees, and for you and for me, it's a warning. It's a, it's a wake-up call. <coughs> Verse 15, that passage we read, You are those who justify yourselves before men. You think your religious deeds are good enough to get you to heaven, but God knows your hearts. There's a very solemn verse in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. God pronounced his judgment on the rich man and Lazarus and it's not what the Pharisees expected. It is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment. And one day it will be your turn. One day it will be your turn to die. And do you have any assurance? Do you have any certainty of where you will go when you die? Have you given any thought to eternity and where you will spend it? 
Now, do stay with me. Keep listening. This story is for you. This gospel message is one of hope and assurance. In in telling this story, Jesus is teaching us that there is life after death. Death is not the end. Death is only the end of your earthly life. All of us will pass into eternity. And all of us will spend eternity either in hell or in heaven. The story teaches that heaven and hell are very real places. They are real places. Now it's true, isn't it? Most people, they like the idea of heaven. If there is a heaven, I hope I'll be there. Or I'm quite a good person. I've tried to live a good life. I'm sure that that will qualify me for a place in heaven. People talk like that, don't they? People think like that. Maybe that describes you this morning, never given any real thought to how you get to heaven. And then there is hell. It's very unpopular, isn't it, to speak of hell, to speak about hell as a real place. People don't want to think about hell. They don't want to think about its possibility. They don't want to think about its reality. And men and women, they will do away with hell. There's no such place. When you die, that's it. You cease to exist. You just evaporate into nothing. There is no such place. That was the lie of Satan. That was the lie of the devil, the lie to Adam and Eve at the very beginning of creation. You will not surely die. There is no place of eternal death. No, no, you'll be like God. There'll be no separation from God. You'll become like God That was the lie of Satan and that deception continues to today. Don't be deceived by the lies of Satan. Some people will accept hell but then they joke about it. Don't they? People will make light of hell. They'll make fun of hell. They'll say, oh, I'll see you in hell. Or they'll think that hell is going to be some great party for all the wicked. They make light of hell. But what is the rich man's testimony Of hell, Jesus has this rich man tell us what hell is like. And he tells us it's a place of torment. He tells us it's a place of anguish. It's a place of unrelenting suffering. There is suffering that is never eased. There is suffering that is never relieved. And it's also a place of no escape. There is no way back. And it's a place so terrible, so awful that you must warn others about it. Jesus has this man tell us, testify to us of what hell is like. Now we're going to look and consider this rich man in hell, but first let's look at Lazarus. Just some thoughts on Lazarus. Lazarus isn't the main character in the story. Um, That's the rich man. Lazarus is silent, isn't he? Lazarus never speaks. But Jesus gives him a name. He doesn't give the rich man a name, but the beggar, he names Lazarus. Now, Lazarus would be a common name. We're not to confuse him with Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. He was a real historical Lazarus. We have to remember this is a parable. This is a a made-up story that Jesus is telling to teach truth. But he names the poor man in the parable Lazarus. And that's very appropriate. The Hebrew form of the name Lazarus means the one who God helps. And Lazarus certainly receives the wonderful help of God. Lazarus is named, why? Because he's known by God. Because he's known in heaven. He is welcomed into heaven. In John chapter 10, Jesus is speaking of the good shepherd Jesus is the good shepherd and Jesus says the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Just a few chapters before in chapter 10 of Luke, Jesus is speaking to his followers and he says to them, Nevertheless, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The poor man is named by Jesus Because he has a living relationship with God. He is known in heaven. But in contrast, the rich man, he's not given a name, is he? Why? Because he's a stranger to God. 
He had no time for God. He had no relationship with God. He has no name. His name is not written in heaven. It's one of the the many contrasts in this parable between Lazarus and the rich man. If you have time in the coming days, go through this parable and just list out all the many, many contrasts between these two men. Here's one, the rich man was materially wealthy, but he is spiritually bankrupt. Lazarus was penniless, but he is spiritually rich. Lazarus knew the immeasurable riches of God's grace and loving kindness to him in Christ Jesus. Which brings us to Lazarus' salvation, his place in heaven. <clears throat> we need to understand Lazarus, he isn't saved because he was poor. Being poor is not a virtue. His hard and difficult life doesn't earn him some right to some eternal happiness. Some people think like that. They think they've had such a hard life here that somehow they'll deserve a better life in eternity. But neither should we think that the rich man was condemned to hell because of his wealth. We've had this recent uproar, haven't we, in the world of football. Here are these fabulously wealthy owners of football clubs. But it was greed that was mentioned the most. Now, wealth and greed, they often go hand in hand, but they are not the same thing. Being rich is not a sin. Abraham, Jesus brings a real person into his story. Abraham in his day was one of the richest people on the face of the earth. We move on a couple of chapters in Luke's gospel and we come to the account of Zacchaeus, a very rich man. He also is a son of Abraham. But unlike the Pharisees, he welcomes Jesus, he receives Jesus, he believes in Jesus and he is saved. He is saving faith and the evidence of that faith is what he does with his wealth. He gives half of it to the poor. That's another story for another time. But what do Abraham and Zacchaeus and this fictional Lazarus, what do they all have in common? What do they have that the rich man doesn't have? They have faith in Jesus Christ. And they have the gift of salvation. That is given by the grace and the mercy of God. By the love of God. Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Lazarus, his faith was in Jesus. It's the only way to heaven. And we are all beggars like Lazarus. We have nothing except what God has given us. We are beggars. We are beggars. We are spiritually bankrupt. We are unclean. We are sinners. We deserve the righteous judgment of God. And all we can do is ask God for mercy. God be merciful to me, a sinner. All we can do is plea for God's mercy. We opened the service, didn't we, with that reading from 1 Peter 1, chapter 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Are you born again this morning? Are you in Christ? Is your faith in Jesus? If it is, then today will you go home and bless the name of God? Will you praise God today for your salvation? Will you give thanks? Sometime today, get on your knees and give thanks to God for his rich mercy and his grace and his goodness to you. And remember this, remember this, your place in heaven is secured because Jesus Christ suffered hell for you. Think of Jesus on the cross in your place, suffering the anguish and the agonies of hell that we read of here. Being forsaken by God, bearing the fiery wrath of God's judgment, bearing your sin that you might be forgiven and that you might have eternal life in him. 
You have a place in glory. There is a place in glory for you when you trust in Jesus. But remember what it cost the Lord Jesus. Lazarus dies. He's carried by the angels to Abraham's side. If you asked a Pharisee where Abraham was, they would reply in heaven. If you asked a Pharisee where the place of honour was, it was to be by Abraham's side. And that's where we find Lazarus. This description of Lazarus being carried by the angels, it's a parable. Jesus is using figurative language, but it speaks, doesn't it, of the care of the soul. God takes care of our souls. It's a comfort for us as, as Christians. It's a comfort for believers. You know, if you've lost a loved one to death who was a believer, a fellow Christian, this speaks, doesn't it, of God's care for their souls. We need to turn our focus to the rich man then. And we have this imaginary conversation that takes place between the rich man in hell and Abraham in heaven. I just remind you, this is a parable. This is not literal. There is no seeing from heaven into hell. There's no communicating between heaven and hell. This conversation is imaginary, but what it teaches us is very real and very important. Abraham is used as the mouthpiece of God. It's very clever on the part of Jesus. Abraham is the father of the nation. The Pharisees, the Jews, they worship the God of Abraham. They're always telling Jesus, we are the offspring of Abraham. We are Abraham's children. So Jesus has Abraham preaching to them in this parable. Verse 23, the rich man finds himself in hell, in the place of torment, in a place of anguish, in a place of eternal suffering. And through this story, we find some awful truths about hell and of the men and women who are found there. Firstly, hell is a place of punishment. It is not remedial. It's not designed to change people for the better. The rich man is conscious of where he is. We're told that he lifted up his eyes. He lifts up his eyes. He's aware of his surroundings. He feels the pain and the anguish. Hell is a conscious place. And he sees, and it's imagined, he sees Abraham and Lazarus in heaven. And he does something that he never did in his earthly life. He asks for mercy. Father Abram, have mercy on me. Not once in his life had he asked for mercy. He never felt the need. Well, but he had a great need. He was a sinner who needed the mercy of God, but he never gave it any thought. He never felt his sin. He never listened to the word of God. He never paid attention to Moses and the prophets. He never wanted to learn the way of salvation. But verse 24, he now comes and he asks, for mercy. He never showed Lazarus any mercy. He never showed Lazarus any kindness, but now he wants it for himself. And we see that this plea, that this request is actually utterly selfish because all he wants is an end to his suffering. All he wants is some relief from his suffering. Lazarus had longed to be relieved of his hunger. Now the rich man is the one longing for some relief. And even in hell, the rich man still thinks he's superior to Lazarus. It's astonishing. Isn't it? Send Lazarus. Lazarus can be the lowly servant. That's all he's good for. He can be the lowly servant serving my needs. It's astonishing. It's despicable, really. But then hell isn't remedial. Hell is not going to cure the rich man's selfishness. Hell only confirms his despicable nature. Hell only punishes. And we see then that with this rich man, for men and women in hell, there is no repentance. In hell, there is no sorry. There is no seeking forgiveness. There is no humility. There is no reflection on why he is in hell 
Then we have Abraham's response. <clears throat> Verse 25, he says, remember. Remember, remember you in your lifetime received your good things. Remember. Will memory be one of the terrible torments of hell? Just think. What a blessing. What an experience. What a privilege to spend three years with Jesus. To spend three years with the Son of God. And then to betray him for money. What bitter, what awful memories will torment Judas Iscariot. The rich man in our story, he had good things. He had privileges. Everything he had had come from God. We're told, you received these good things. He received them. Who did he receive them from? He had received them from God, but he never acknowledged that they were from God. He never used them to serve God. Or to glorify God. God has made a world full of riches and wonderful things for us to enjoy. What do we do with the good things that God has given us? The rich man, you see, he made those things his gods. They became idols to him and he worshipped his wealth. Jesus said you cannot serve God and money. His devotion was to wealth. So he despised God. And then the second part of Abraham's response. We have the finality of hell. Abraham says there is a great chasm that has been fixed. There's a great chasm between heaven and hell. There's no escape. It's forever. The door is locked and the key is thrown away. There's no second chance. There's no turning to God. Once you're in hell, you can never get to heaven. And no one in heaven can ever go to hell. You didn't want to give up sin in this life. You wouldn't give up sin in this life. Then you live with the consequences of your sin in the next life. Does God have no part in your life now? then you will have no part of God then. Once you're in hell, it will be too late. You'll be too late to do anything about it. Too late to repent. Too late to receive mercy. Too late to put your faith in Jesus. Everyone in hell believes in Jesus, but it'll be too late then. You need to believe now. You need to trust Jesus now, today. Well, the rich man, he's unable to get any comfort or relief for himself. His fate has been fixed forever. He has another request for Abraham. And again, he does something that he never did in his earthly life. He begs. Lazarus was once the beggar. Now the rich man is the beggar. Verse 27, then I beg you, father, to send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. To warn them lest they come into this place of torment. Mm. Is this <clears throat> some concern for others? Are we seeing some compassion? Is this some love for his family? I don't think so. I don't believe that's the case. I don't believe this is love or compassion. There is no love in hell. There is no compassion for men in hell. There's not even one tiny drop of love or compassion in hell no I believe this request is simply to spare himself even more torment he doesn't want his brothers there he doesn't want their blood on his hands he doesn't want to have their souls on his conscience they're only going to add to his torments they're going to blame him we followed you Big brother, we wanted to be like you. You were our example and look where it's got us. He doesn't want them there because they will only add to his torment. Send Lazarus to warn them. And Abraham's answer, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They have the word of God. But they would not listen. 
Would they pay any attention to the Bible? Would they pay any attention to the word of God? The Apostle Paul wrote, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Everything you need to know to escape hell and to get to heaven is found in the Bible. But the rich man says, no, you're wrong. No, the Bible is not enough. Even from hell, the rich man says, you're wrong, God. You're wrong. You need more than just the gospel and the word of God. He says, no, but if someone goes to, from the, if someone goes to them from the dead, then they will repent. Then they will believe. These Pharisees, they were always asking for signs. They're always asking Jesus for a sign from heaven. And Jesus said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. Jonah went to Nineveh and preached repentance. And the men of Nineveh repented. No, but if someone goes to goes to them from the dead, then they will repent. The trouble is for the Pharisees, that happened and it didn't make a difference. It didn't make a difference. Verse 31, Abraham says, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced should someone rise from the dead. And there's so much truth in that. Jesus brings true prophecy into this made up parable someone did rise from the dead shortly after Jesus told this parable a different Lazarus the real historical Lazarus and we have the account in John's gospel Lazarus had fallen ill and he died and he was buried and Jesus came to the tomb and Jesus calls him out of the tomb and he brings Lazarus back to life And when the Pharisees find out, when they are told, do they believe? Do they believe in Jesus? No. From that day on, they made plans to put him to death. They gave orders that if anyone knew who, where Jesus was, to let them know so that they might arrest Jesus. Betrayed, arrested, put on trial sentenced, crucified, buried, resurrected. The Lord Jesus rose from the dead. The Lord Jesus himself came back from the dead. Did they believe in him then? No. Did they repent then? No. Instead, they covered it up. They paid off the guards at the tomb. They tell tell people that his disciples came and stole his body. They suppressed the truth, they condemned themselves, and they didn't heed the warning of this parable. Don't be like them. For the rich man in hell, it was too late. But it's not too late for you. Life is short. Life is so very short. That little boy, that boy in the children's talk, is 40 years ago. 40 years ago. Where does 40 years go? Life is short, but eternity is forever. Life is short, eternity is forever. The time to act is now. If the rich man had listened to the prophets, what might he have heard? Will you listen? Jeremiah 29, thus says the Lord, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Isaiah 45, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Joel 2, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me close with this. 
when I was a young teenager, some of you here are young teenagers, I was just getting into uh, rock music. My older sister had a, a cassette tape. Some of you have probably never seen a cassette tape. Who'd have thought that one day you'd listen to music on your phone? I had a cassette tape and it was a tape of a new young Irish band from Dublin called U2. Well, U2 have gone on to be one of the biggest best-selling bands in the world. They've released 67 singles. Their first ever single was called Out of Control. Out of Control. What was it that was out of control? Was it them? Was this about them? Was this about crazy, wild, young rock, punk rockers out of control? No, it was nothing of the sort. This was about an 18-year-old songwriter and his dawning realisation that there were two things in his life that were outside of his control. Two things that he had no control over, no say in. Two things, his birth and his death. The song begins with his birth, but the song ends with these lines. One day I'll die, the choice will not be mine. Will it be too late? You can't tempt fate. One day you will die. And one day you will enter into eternity. And you will go to one of only two places. To heaven or to hell. But where you go is not out of control. Where you go is not out of your control. You have a choice. Where you go depends on the choices and the decisions that you make here and now in this life. What will you do with your sin? Will you cling to it? Will you love it? Will you let it rule you? Will you let it enslave you? Will you let it bring you down to hell? Or will you turn away from sin? Will you repent of your sin? Will you seek God? Will you cry for mercy and ask for his forgiveness? What will you do with the gospel message? God offers sinful people eternal life. It's an offer. Christ died for sinners. Christ died that you might be forgiven. That you might go to heaven saved by his precious blood. What will you do with the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you reject him or will you receive him as your saviour? Will you not today take him as your saviour? They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. You have the gospel. And these things are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Great God of heaven. Our loving, merciful Father, we have this parable that uh, Jesus told. And it is a wake-up call, it is a warning. Here were these religious men, and they thought they had a place in heaven. And they were so wrong. Oh, our God, we pray that you would open our hearts, open our ears, let us heed the warning and the message of this parable. And we thank you that in Jesus Christ, there is a great and glorious salvation we pray lord that this day we might respond to this message that we might praise and thank you for your mercy to us or that you might show mercy to those who are lost lord grant that gift of faith to any here who do not believe for god you are a god who is rich in mercy and grace and we give you thanks for our savior amen